Tonight's lecture is over the origin and diversification of life on Earth. Our learning objectives for this chapter are to be able to define life, to outline the conditions and evidence that support how life on Earth was formed. We will also be able to explain how to identify and name a species. Then we will compare and contrast the biological species concept and the morphological species concept. We will be able to understand the purpose of a phylogenetic tree and what it can demonstrate. We will also be able to define the difference between analogous traits and homologous features. We will be able to compare and contrast microevolution and macroevolution. We will be able to explain how adaptive radiation and extinction impacts evolution. And finally, we will understand the current biodiversity found in the three domains of life. In the beginning, there was nothing. Now there is something. That, in a nutshell, describes one of the most important, yet difficult to resolve, questions in science. How did life on Earth begin? Earth formed approximately 4.5 billion years ago from clouds of dust and gases. As Earth gradually cooled, a crust formed at the surface and condensing water formed the oceans. This probably took several hundred million years. The oldest rocks found in Canada are about 3.8 billion years old, and the earliest life forms appeared not long after these first rocks formed. Fossilized bacteria-like cells have been found in rocks that are about 3.5 billion years old. How did the first organisms arise? Some have suggested that life may have originated elsewhere in the universe and traveled to Earth, possibly on a meteor. But the vast majority of scientists believe that life originated on Earth probably in several distinct phases. Recall from chapter 1 that life is defined by the ability to replicate and by the presence of some sort of metabolic activity. The chemical processes by which molecules are acquired and used and energy is transformed in controlled reactions. And that brings us to phase 1, the formation of small molecules containing carbon and hydrogen. We know from chemical analyses of ancient rock that no oxygen gas was present on Earth around the time of the origin of life. The atmosphere included large amounts of carbon dioxide, nitrogen, methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and hydrogen sulfide, mostly produced by volcanic eruptions. This environment probably served as the cradle of life, or what Darwin called the quote-unquote warm little pond. So, critical to the origin of life was the formation of small molecules containing carbon and hydrogen. As we saw in a previous chapter, carbon readily bonds with hydrogen and with other carbon atoms, creating molecules in a variety of forms that can interact with each other in processes that are essential to life. The most likely scenario for how these small organic molecules might have formed comes from experiments done in 1953 by a 23-year-old graduate student named Stanley Miller and his advisor, Harold Uri. Miller and Uri created a model of the warm little pond and their best estimate of Earth's early atmosphere a flask containing water plus dihydrogen, methane, and ammonia gases. Second, they subjected this mini-world to electricity to simulate lightning. Then, they cooled the atmosphere inside the flask so that any compounds formed in it would rain back down into the water. Then they waited, and then they examined the contents of the water to see what happened. Within days, they discovered many organic molecules, including five different amino acids, in their primordial sea. Questions remain, such as whether the environment that Uri and Miller assumed to exist on the early Earth is actually likely to have existed. Nonetheless, 
the experiments are a promising first step, suggesting that amino acids, an essential component of living systems, could have been produced in the primitive environment of Earth. And phase two was the formation of self-replicating information-containing molecules. In the second phase, the generation of life from non-life is where things get a bit more speculative. It's complicated to generate an organic molecule that can replicate itself. Researchers believe that to get to the replication phase, enzymes or something with catalytic activity of enzymes were required. So, researchers recently discovered that the nucleic acid RNA can do what proteins do, that is, catalyze reactions necessary for replication. In other words, this single, relatively simple molecule could have been a self-replicating system and a precursor to cellular life. In the early world, self-replicating nucleic acid molecules probably carried the information on how to replicate and served as the machinery to carry out the replication. But is that enough to be considered living? Based on our definition of life, the ability to replicate and the ability to carry out some sort of metabolism, these early self-replicating RNA molecules were close to being considered living. They were able to replicate, but they could not carry out metabolism. What then were the first truly living organisms on Earth? Well, fossils of 3.5 billion year old cells have been found in the rocks of South Africa and Australia. These cells appear to be prokaryotic cells similar to living bacterial cells with no nucleus, no organelles, and a circular strand of genetic information. Some even look as if they were in the process of dividing. Several lines of evidence support the idea that they are indeed remnants of cells. First, the age of the rocks themselves has been reliably determined. Second, the size of the circular impressions in the rocks is similar to that of modern-day prokaryotes. And third, the ratio of two carbon isotopes, that is, carbon-12 and carbon-13, is more characteristic of fossilized organisms than of typical rocks that do not contain fossils. Yet many questions remain unanswered. Were these cells the first living organisms on Earth? And were they descendants of earlier self-replicating molecules of RNA? Well, that brings us to phase three, which is the development of a membrane enabling metabolism and creating the first cells. As we saw in chapter 4, cell membranes are semi-permeable barriers that separate the inside of cells from their external environments. Membranes make numerous aspects of metabolism possible. In particular, they make it possible to have different concentrations of chemicals inside the cell versus outside the cell. Differences in chemical concentrations inside and outside a cell are essential to most life-supporting reactions. So combining a self-replicating molecule of some metabolic chemicals into a unit surrounded by a membrane would make life possible. But how could this have happened initially? Some evidence suggests that the first cells may simply have formed spontaneously. Researchers have found that mixtures of phospholipids placed in water or salt solutions tend to spontaneously form a small spherical unit that resembles a living cell. These units may even, quote-unquote, sprout new buds appearing to divide. Because these cell-like units do not have any genetic material, however, they cannot be considered alive. But imagine that. At some point, units like these incorporated some self-replicating molecules inside, maybe by forming around them, such as microspheres, might have been important in the third phase in the generation of life from non-life. The compartmentalization of self-replicating information-containing molecules into cells. If this did occur, the final step in the creation of something from nothing would be complete. 
And that brings us to our take-home message for section 12.1. The earliest life on Earth dates to at least 3.5 billion years ago. Self-replicating molecules, possibly RNAs, may have formed in Earth's early environment and later acquired or developed membranes, enabling them to replicate and making metabolism possible. The two conditions that define life. Moving on. A cat and a mouse are different living things. Oprah Winfrey and Bill Gates, on the other hand, are different versions of the same thing. That is, although they are different individuals, both are humans. How do we know when to classify two individuals as members of different groups and when to classify them as members of the same group? Well, biologists use the word species to label different kinds of organisms. According to the biological species concept, species are populations of organisms that interbreed or could possibly interbreed with each other under natural conditions and cannot interbreed with organisms from other such groups. So notice that the biological species concept completely ignores physical appearance when defining a species. Instead, it emphasizes reproductive isolation, the inability of individuals from two populations to produce fertile offspring with each other, thereby precluding gene exchange between the populations. Let's clarify two important features of the biological species concept. First, it holds that members of a species are actually interbreeding or could possibly interbreed. Just because two individuals are physically separated, they aren't necessarily of different species. Two people living in different countries, for example, may not be able to mate because of the distance, but if they were brought to the same location, they could. Second, our definition refers only to quote-unquote natural conditions. This distinction is important because occasionally, in captivity, individuals may interbreed that would not interbreed in the wild, such as zebras and horses. So there are two types of barriers that prevent individuals of different species from reproducing. They are prezygotic and postzygotic. Remember, an egg that has been fertilized by a sperm cell is called a zygote. So that's where the term prezygotic and postzygotic comes from. Prezygotic barriers make it impossible for individuals to mate with each other, or if they can mate, make it impossible for the male's reproductive cell to fertilize the female's reproductive cell. These barriers include situations in which the members of the two species have different courtship rituals or have physical differences that prevent mating or fertilization. Next is the postzygotic barrier. Postzygotic barriers occur after fertilization and generally prevent the production of fertile offspring from individuals of two different species. These barriers are responsible for the production of hybrid individuals that either do not survive long after fertilization or, if they do survive, are infertile or have reduced fertility. Mules, for example, are the hybrid offspring of horses and donkeys. Although they can survive, they cannot produce offspring. Actually, on very rare occasions, mules can be fertile. If non-disjunction was to occur on certain chromosomes after a horse and a donkey were to mate, then it is possible, and but very rare, that a mule could be fertile. So, once we identify a species, how do we keep track of them? Well, Swedish biologist Carlos Linnaeus developed a way to name and classify living organisms in the mid-1700s that we still use today. Every species is given a scientific name that consists of two parts, a genus and a specific epithet. Linnaeus named humans Homo sapiens, meaning, quote-unquote, wise man. Homo is the genus, and sapiens is the specific epithet. So Homo sapiens is the species name. The genus, capitalize, the specific epithet, lowercase, and they are both italicized. So the strength of Linnaeus' system is that it is hierarchical. Each element of the system falls under a single element 
in the level just above it. The narrowest classification in the Linnaean system is the species. The name for every species within a genus is unique, but many different species may be in the same genus. Similarly, many genera are grouped within a family, and many families are grouped within an order. Orders are grouped within a class, and classes are grouped within a phylum. Finally, as Linnaeus originally set it up, all phyla were classified under one of three kingdoms, the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, or the quote-unquote mineral kingdom. Today, many of the species classifications that Linnaeus described have been revised. Some of his designations, such as the mineral kingdom, are now left without, while other kingdoms, fungi, protists, eubacteria, and archaebacteria have been added. Also, all of the kingdoms are now classified under an even higher order of classification, the domain. But Linnaeus's basic hierarchical structure remains, and all life on earth is still named using this system. When new species are discovered, they are classified based on the Linnaean system, and when it comes to assigning a specific epithet, scientists sometimes have a little fun. Recently, a rare species of horsefly was named Scaptia beyonciae, in honor of the dense golden hairs on the fly's abdomen that are apparently reminiscent of the singer Beyonce's hairstyle and sparkling costumes. And in honor of Elvis Presley, a wasp species was named Presicoila immalshucapus. A variety of other celebrities also have had species named after them, including the Beatles, Mick Jagger, Kate Winslet, and Steven Spielberg. Yeah, I just don't get it. I don't get what's with the celebrity worship. It's idolization. It's just, I don't know. I'd probably name them different. That brings us to our take-home message for section 12.3. Species are generally defined as populations of individuals that either do or could interbreed and that cannot interbreed with organisms from other such groups. Each species is given a unique name using a hierarchical system of classification and is classified into one of three domains. Moving on, biologists, like all humans, can be biased. When investigating the natural world, for example, they often focus on plants and animals to the exclusion of the rest of the Earth's rich biodiversity. For example, the biological species concept is remarkably useful when describing most plants and animals, but it falls short of representing a universal and definitive way of distinguishing many of the life forms on Earth. So species are not always easily defined. First, there's difficulties in classifying asexual species. The biological species concept defines species as populations of interbreeding individuals. But because asexual reproduction does not involve partners or interbreeding, the concept of reproductive isolation is meaningless. It might seem that every individual should be considered a separate species. Clearly, that's not a helpful rule to follow. Next, there's difficulties in classifying fossil species. Because when classifying fossil species, differences in the size and shape of fossil bones from different individuals can never definitively reveal whether there was reproductive isolation between those individuals. This makes it impossible to apply the biological species concept. Next, there are difficulties in determining when one species has changed into another. Based on fossils, it seems that modern-day humans, Homo sapiens, probably evolved from a related species called Homo heidelbergensis about 250,000 to 400,000 years ago. This seems reasonable until you consider that your parents, who are in the species Homo sapiens, were born to your Homo sapiens grandparents, who were born to your Homo sapiens great-grandparents, and so on. If humans evolve from Homo heidelbergensis, at what exact point did H. heidelbergensis turn into H. sapiens? It does make sense to identify the exact point at which this change occurred. Also, living 
in Central Asia are some small insect-eating songbirds called greenish warblers. Unable to live at higher elevations of the Tibetan mountain range, the warblers live in a ring around it. At the southern end of the mountain range, in the northwest area of India, the warblers interbreed with each other. Along either side of the range, the warbler population is split, and warblers on one side do not interbreed with those on the other. And this is because they are separated by a mountain range, where the two side populations meet up again at the northernmost end of the mountain range in the forests of Siberia, they can no longer interbreed. What happened? Gradual changes in the warblers on each side of the mountain range accumulated so that the two populations that meet up in Siberia are sufficiently different physically and behaviorally, and that they have became reproductively incompatible. But because the two non-interbreeding populations in the north are connected by gene flow through other populations farther south, there is no exact point at which one species stops and the other begins. So where do you draw the line? The greenish warblers are just one example of more than 20 such ring species that biologists have described. And that brings us to another difficulty in classifying species, and that's classifying hybrid species. Increasingly, hybridization, that is, the interbreeding of closely related species, has been observed among plant and animal species. In some cases, such as among butterflies in the genus Heliconeus, the hybrids have high survival rates and are fertile, whether interbreeding with one another or with individuals of either of the two parental species. This suggests that the borders between the species are not always clear-cut. All of these shortcomings have prompted the development of alternative approaches to defining what a species is. These alternatives tend to focus on aspects of organisms other than reproductive isolation as defining features. The most commonly used alternative is the morphological species concept, which characterizes species based on physical features such as body size and shape. Although the choice of which features to use is subjective, an important aspect of the morphological species concept is that it can be used effectively to classify asexual species. Also, because it does not require knowledge of whether individuals can actually interbreed, the morphological species concept is a bit easier to use when observing organisms in the wild. Although the biological species concept is the most widely used definition of species and can be applied without difficulty to most plants and animals, there will probably never be a universally applicable definition of what a species is. From asexual species to ring species to hybridizing species, the diversity of the natural world is simply too great to fit into one neat, completely defined, and distinct little box. Nonetheless, scientists generally use a species definition that is satisfactory for a particular situation. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 12.4. The biological species concept is useful when describing most plants and animals, but it falls short as a way of distinguishing many life forms. Difficulties arise when classifying asexual species, fossil species, species arising over long periods of time, ring species, and hybridizing species. Moving on, we don't know how many species there are on Earth. Estimates vary tremendously from 5 million to 100 million. Biologists do, however, know the process by which these species arose. The process of speciation, in which one species splits into two distinct species, occurs in two phases and requires more than just evolutionary change in a population. The first phase of speciation is reproductive isolation in which two populations become separated from one another and so come to have independent evolutionary fates. The second phase is genetic divergence in which two populations evolving separately accumulate physical and behavioral differences over time. 
These differences may arise as random, neutral mutations or through each population adapting differently to features of its unique environment, including different predators and different types of food. When physical and behavioral differences have accumulated that prevent members of the two populations from interbreeding, we say that speciation has occurred. Often, the initial reproductive isolation necessary for speciation arises when two populations are geographically separated. Although it is an effective and common way for speciation to occur, speciation can also occur without it. So let's first talk about allopatric speciation. Allopatric speciation is speciation with geographic isolation. Suppose the local climate grows wetter and a river forms that splits one population of squirrels into two separate populations. Because the squirrels cannot cross the river, the populations on either side are reproductively isolated from one another. Over time, the two populations have different evolutionary paths as they accumulate different mutations and adapt to particular features of their separate habitats, which may differ. Eventually, the two populations might genetically diverge so much that even if the populations came back into contact, squirrels from the two groups could no longer interbreed. In fact, two species of antelope ground squirrels have formed on the north and south rims of the Grand Canyon as a result of this type of speciation. Speciation that occurs as a result of geographic isolation is known as allopatric speciation. So another example of allopatric speciation is seen in the various finch species of the Galapagos Islands, the same finch species that Darwin observed and collected. Individual finches from the nearest mainland, now known as Ecuador, originally colonized one or more of the islands. Later, additional islands may have been colonized by birds from the mainland or from previously colonized islands. But because the islands are far apart, the finches tended not to travel between them and the populations remained reproductively isolated from one another. Consequently, 14 different finch species have evolved on the Galapagos Islands, with each species adapting to the predominant food source on its particular island and now having features that allow it to specialize in eating certain of the wide range of insects, buds, and seeds found on the islands. Only one species of finch is found in mainland Ecuador. The barrier doesn't have to be an expanse of water. The formation of a glacier could split a population into two or more isolated populations, or a drop of the water level in a lake might expose strips of land that divide the lake into detached smaller bodies of water, separating one large population of fish into two distinct populations. In each case, the result is the same. Geographic isolation enforces reproductive isolation. Researchers can easily create new species in the lab using an analogous strategy. In one experiment, a single population of fruit flies was divided into two. The two populations were then maintained on different diets, one on the sugar maltose and the other on a starch-based food. After only eight generations of enforced reproductive isolation and adaptation to their differing nutritional environments, the populations had diverged sufficiently to form separate species. When the populations were mixed, the fruit flies from one population would no longer interbreed with the flies from the other population. Now we'll shift gears to sympatric speciation, that is, speciation without geographic isolation. Speciation can also occur among populations that overlap geographically, a phenomenon that is called sympatric speciation. Among vertebrates, populations of the same animal rarely become reproductively isolated when they coexist in the same area, so this method of speciation is relatively uncommon. But it is common among plants, and it occurs in one of two ways. So during cell division in plants, both in the reproductive cells and in other cells of the plant body, 
An error sometimes occurs in which the chromosomes are duplicated, but a cell does not divide. This creates a new cell that can grow into an individual with twice as many sets of chromosome as the parents from which it came. The new individual may have four sets of chromosomes, for example, while the other individual had two sets. This doubling of the number of sets of chromosomes is called polyploidy. The individual with four sets of chromosomes can no longer interbreed with individuals having only two sets because their offspring would have three sets. They would have two sets from the parent that had four and one set from the parent that had two, which could not divide evenly during cell division. The individual with four sets can, however, propagate through self-fertilization or by mating with other individuals that also have four sets. As a consequence, the individuals with four sets of chromosomes have achieved instant reproductive isolation from the original population and are therefore considered a new species. Although rare in animals, speciation by polyploidy has occurred several times among tree frogs. A much more common method of sympatric speciation occurs when plants of different but closely related species interbreed, forming a hybrid. The hybrid may not be able to interbreed with either of the parental species, but it may be able to propagate asexually as many plants can. Meiosis often is disrupted in hybrids, causing a chromosome doubling, which is called polyploidy. When this occurs, the hybrids with the doubled number of chromosome sets can interbreed with each other. This method of speciation has led to the production of many important crop plants, including wheat, bananas, potatoes, and coffee. Whether populations are separated from each other allopatrically or sympatrically, speciation is not considered complete until sufficient differences have evolved in the two populations that they could no longer interbreed even if they did come into contact. Separation of two populations of a species can occur relatively quickly, that is as long as it takes for a new river or a freeway to divide one large population into two, but the genetic divergence that causes true reproductive isolation can take a very long time, sometimes thousands of years. For this reason, speciation can be difficult to study and observe. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 12.5. Speciation is the process by which one species splits into two distinct species that are reproductively isolated. It can occur by polyploidy or by a combination of geographic isolation and genetic divergence. Moving on. Although Linnaeus's method for naming species was an important step in categorizing and cataloging Earth's biodiversity, his classification of organisms into hierarchical groups was based on nothing more than his own evaluation of how physically similar various organisms appeared. The modern classification system, called systematics, has the broader goal of reconstructing the phylogeny or evolutionary history of organisms. That is, through systematics, all species, even extinct species, are named and arranged in a manner that indicates the common ancestors they share and the points at which the species diverged. A common phylogeny of all organisms is like a family tree for all species, past and present. So a phylogenetic tree not only shows the relationships among organisms, but also presents a hypothesis about evolutionary history. At the beginning of life on Earth, there was the first living organism, one that could replicate itself. Then a speciation event occurred, after which the population of the first living organism split into two independent evolutionary lineages. The phylogenetic tree had its first branch, and there was biodiversity. Over hundreds of millions of years, speciation events continued to occur, and today the tree has branches with millions of tips that represent all the species on Earth. Moving up a branch of any evolutionary tree from its trunk toward the tips, we can see when groups split with each branching point representing a speciation event. 
And that brings us to our take-home message for section 12.6. The history of life can be visualized as a tree. By tracing from the branches backward to the trunk, we can follow the pathway back from descendants to their ancestors. Moving on. The evolutionary tree of life can be thought of as one giant tree, but as a practical matter, biologists often study only particular branches. These branches can be illustrated as big trees or little trees and can be expanded to include whatever organisms the biologist is studying. The tree might, for example, include all animals or just rodents. The trunk and branches of any version of an evolutionary tree represent ancestor-descendant relationships that link living organisms with all life that has ever existed on Earth. It does not matter on which side of the tree you put a particular group of organisms. Any branches can be spun around the nodes at which they split. This pinwheel effect means that you cannot assume by looking at the figure that rats are more evolutionarily advanced than mice or vice versa. They are equally advanced in the sense that both groups derive from the same speciation event. Evolutionary trees do not tell us which groups are most quote-unquote primitive and are most quote-unquote advanced. This property of phylogenetic trees can serve to undermine some of our most sacred beliefs, such as the one that humans are the pinnacle of evolution. Many trees can be drawn to support this idea, including figure 12.14 on page 354 of your book. But notice that if you rotate a part of this tree around any one of its nodes, you can get a number of different trees. What trees do tell us is which groups are most closely related to which other groups. One of the most interesting revelations of Tree thinking is that despite appearances, fungi such as mushrooms, yeasts, and molds are more closely related to animals than to plants. So, biologists use the term monophyletic to describe any group in which all of the individuals are more closely related to each other than to any individuals outside that group. Monophyletic groups are determined by looking at the nodes of the trees. For example, birds and crocodiles taken together compose a monophyletic group because they share a more recent common ancestor than either group shares with lizards or mammals. Lizards and crocodiles taken together do not compose a monophyletic group because their common ancestor is also shared by birds. But birds crocodiles, and lizards all taken together do compose a monophyletic group by virtue all three sharing the common ancestor. Similarly, birds, crocodiles, lizards, and mammals compose a monophyletic group. So reading an evolutionary tree reveals which groups are more closely related and approximately how long ago they shared a common ancestor but how evolutionary trees, which might hypothesize historical events such as cat-dog split, which happened about 60 million years ago, constructed in the first place. Until a few decades ago, these trees were assembled by looking carefully at numerous physical features or traits of species and generating tables that compared these features across the species. So let's look at figure 12.17 on page 356 of your book. This is a simple example of such a table, showing a clear split between the characteristics of the lion and the hyena on one hand, and the wolf and the bear on the other. For most of the 20th century, biologists classifying organisms would often use 50 or more traits to generate a tree. So then, beginning in the 1980s, biologists began using molecular sequences rather than physical traits to generate evolutionary trees. The rationale for this approach is that organisms inherit DNA from their ancestors. So, as species diverge, their DNA sequences also diverge, becoming increasingly different. As more time passes following the splitting of one species into two, the differences in their DNA sequences become greater. 
By comparing how similar the DNA sequences are between two groups, it is possible to estimate how long ago they shared a common ancestor. Using DNA sequences to construct evolutionary trees is not really different from using physical traits. Each DNA base pair can be thought of as a quote-unquote trait, and many of these traits can be compared. Although most evolutionary trees are now produced by using molecular sequence comparisons when it comes to actually naming species, we will still use Linnaeus's system, assigning a species name and fitting the new species within the other categories such as kingdom, class, and family. This can be difficult because there is no objective way to assign groups above the level of species. For example, deciding whether multiple genera should be grouped into the same or different families or whether multiple families should be grouped into the same or different orders. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 12.7. Evolutionary trees are hypotheses about ancestor-descendant relationships among species. Moving on. Whales and sharks have fins. Bats and many insects have wings. Do bats have wings because they are most closely related to insects and inherited their wings from a common winged ancestor? Or did insects and bats' wings evolve independently? As the evolutionary tree in figure 12.19 on page 358 of your book indicates, insects' wings and bats' wings evolved independently. Wings are an adaptation that arose separately on more than one occasion. So mapping a species characteristics onto phylogenetic trees provides us with the story of evolution. For example, biologists initially thought that African golden moles belonged to the order known as insectivores, which includes shrews, hedgehogs, and other moles. Moles have many characteristics in common with these other animals. They are small, they have long, narrow snouts, their eyes are tiny, and they live in underground burrows. Biologists thought that this group of characteristics evolved just once, and that all species in the insectivore order possessed these characteristics because they inherited them from a common ancestor. Recent DNA evidence reveals that African golden moles are more closely related to elephants than to insectivores, including all of the other mole species. The reason they look so similar to insectivores is because of a phenomenon called converge evolution, which occurs when populations of different organisms live in similar environments and so experience similar selective forces. Analogous traits are characteristics such as bat wings and insect wings that are similar because they were produced by convergent evolution, not because they descended from a common structure in a shared ancestor. Features that are inherited from a common ancestor are called homologous features. All mammals have hair, for example, because they inherited this trait from a common ancestor. Analogous features can cause problems when biologists are constructing evolutionary trees because they are the result of natural selection rather than relatedness. But we can determine whether traits are homologous or analogous by using DNA analysis. DNA sequences do not become increasingly similar during convergent evolution, so molecular phylogenies cannot be fooled. This is an important reason why molecular-based evolutionary trees are preferable to trees based on physical features. Although analogous features are not helpful in constructing evolutionary trees, convergence provides some of the best evidence for the power of natural selection. For example, from the 19th to the 20th centuries in industrialized parts of Europe, a large number of distinct butterfly and moth species became darker and darker. This change was not the result of their sharing a common ancestor, but was due to natural selection. The light-colored moths and butterflies were easy targets for predators when they landed on trees that were covered by dark, industry-produced soot. 
As a consequence, natural selection led to a rapid evolution of body color, with many species converging on a darker coloration at the same time. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 12.8. Evolutionary trees are best constructed by comparing organisms' DNA sequences rather than physical similarities because convergent evolution can cause distantly related organisms to appear closely related, but it does not increase their DNA sequence similarity. Moving on, when water runs over rocks, it wears them away. This process is simple and slow, yet powerful enough to have created the Grand Canyon. No additional physical processes are necessary. The process of evolution has a lot in common with the stream of water wearing away solid rock. In the short term, it produces small changes in a population, yet the accumulation of these changes over the long term can be canyonesque. So think about these examples of large-scale changes. One, the production of a 200-ton dinosaur from rabbit-sized reptile ancestors, and two, the diversification from a single species of flowering plant into more than 230 species. Evolutionary change involving the origins of entirely new groups of organisms is referred to as macroevolution. This can be contrasted with phenomena that involve changes in allele frequencies within a population, which is referred to as microevolution, such as the increase in milk production by cows during the 20th century or gradual change in the average beak size of birds with changing patterns of rainfall. These micro and macro events might seem like two very different processes, but they are not. Evolution, whether at the micro or macro level, is one thing only, a change in allele frequencies in a population. In the short term, over one or a few generations, evolution can appear a slight and gradual change within a species. Over the long term, these gradual accumulating changes may combine with reproductive isolation causing the dramatic phenomenon described as macroevolution. In a sense, microevolution is the process and macroevolution is the result. So the pace of microevolution and macroevolution, however, is far from constant. If you listen to some scientists debating their research, you might hear one side describing evolution by jerks and the other side saying evolution by creeps. They're not gearing up for a fight out in the schoolyard. They're just debating the pace of evolution. The traditional model of evolutionary change recognizes that populations slowly but surely accumulate sufficient genetic differences for speciation, hence the phrase evolution by creeps. Spurred on by findings from the fossil record that do not always support this view, however, researchers have come to believe that evolution may often occur in a different way. Brief periods of rapid evolutionary change that occur immediately after speciation, followed by long periods with relatively little change, hence evolution by jerks. The newer view of the pace of evolution in which long periods of relatively little evolutionary change are interrupted by bursts of rapid change is called punctuated equilibrium. In nature, we find examples of both gradual change and the irregular pattern of punctuated equilibrium. For many groups of organisms, such as mammals, the fossil record reveals a long period in which particular species seem to change very little. This period is followed by the appearance of a large number of newer but clearly related species, but no records of fossils that show the transition from the old to the new. For other groups, such transitional fossils do exist. For example, very complete sets of fossils reveal the transitional sequence from fox-like ancient terrestrial mammals to modern whales. In the end, evolution does not occur at the same rate across all species. Some species have spent vast periods of time with little change at all. 
The fish species, Calacanus, for example, seem to have undergone almost no physical changes over more than 300 million years. Other species, such as the extinct marine invertebrates known as trilobites, changed gradually over the course of their entire evolutionary history. For any organism, the rate of evolutionary change depends on the selective forces acting on the population. Strong and directional forces may act over long periods of time and lead to rapid change, whereas stabilizing selection may lead to very little change. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 12.9. The process of evolution changes in allele frequencies within a population in conjunction with reproductive isolation is sufficient to produce speciation. The fossil record reveals long periods with little evolutionary change punctuated by rapid periods of change. In other cases, species may change at a more gradual but consistent pace. Moving on, as mammals, it might seem that we owe a little of our success to luck. 66 million years ago, our mammalian ancestors were rodent-sized, insect-eating, nocturnal creatures that didn't occupy anything like the dominant position in life's hierarchy that we hold today. It is the dinosaur's time. These giant reptiles ruled the earth. All that changed when the Earth was struck by an asteroid about six miles in diameter near what is today the eastern part of Mexico. Environmental conditions on Earth changed drastically following the impact, and almost all the dinosaur species were wiped out. Scientists continue to debate whether the asteroid was the main cause of the dinosaur's extinction or one of several contributing factors. But what is clear is that our mammalian ancestors survived and found themselves living on a planet without much competition. They were in the right place at the right time. What followed was an explosive expansion of mammalian species. In a brief period of time, a small number of species diversified into a much larger number of species able to live in a wide diversity of habitats. Called an adaptive radiation, such large, rapid diversifications have occurred many times throughout history. So I'd like to talk about three different types of phenomenon that tend to trigger adaptive radiations. One is mass extinction events. With the near total disappearance of the dinosaurs, mammals suddenly had few competitors. Not surprisingly, the number of mammalian species increased from perhaps just a few hundred to more than 4,000 species in about 130 genera. This happened over a span of about 10 million years, barely the blink of an eye by geological standards. Following other large-scale extinctions, numerous other groups that suddenly lost most of their competitors experienced similar adaptive radiations. Two is colonization events. In a rare event, one or a few birds or small insects will fly off from a mainland and end up on a distant island group such as Hawaii or the Galapagos Islands. Once there, the new arrivals tend to find a large number of opportunities for adaptation and diversification. In the Galapagos, we learned that finch species evolved from a single species found on the nearest mainland about 600 miles away. In Hawaii, there are several hundred species of fruit flies, all believed to evolve from one species that colonized the islands, perhaps blown there by a storm or carried there, stuck in the feathers of a bird, and experienced an adaptive radiation. Third is evolutionary innovations. Computer software developers are always looking for the killer app, a new application so useful that it opens up a large new niche in the software market or greatly expands the existing niche. The first spreadsheet software, email program, and web browser were killer apps. In nature, evolution sometimes produces killer apps too. For example, the wings and the rigid outer skeleton that appeared in insects helped them diversify into the most successful group of animals with more than 800,000 species known today more than 100 times the number of mammalian species. 
The flower is another innovation that propelled an explosion of diversity and ensured the evolutionary success of the flowering plants relative to the non-flowering plants such as ferns and pine trees. Today, about 9 out of 10 plant species are flowering plants. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 12.10. Adaptive radiations, brief periods of time during which a small number of species diversify into a much larger number of species, tend to be triggered by mass extinctions of potentially competing species, colonizations of new habitats, or the appearance of evolutionary innovations. Forests keep disappearing. Rivers dry up wildlife's becoming extinct, the climate's ruined, and the land grows poorer and uglier every day. Anton Chekhov, Uncle Vanya, 1899. If the past is a guide to the future, we know that no species lasts forever. Speciation continually produces new species and extinction. The complete loss of all individuals in a species population takes them away. Extinction is always occurring and is faced by all species. For any given time in Earth's history, scientists can estimate the rate of extinctions. This rate can be expressed in several different ways, such as the number of species that become extinct over a given period of time. And the evidence reveals that these rates are far from constant. So, although the details differ in most cases, extinctions generally fall into one of two categories, background extinctions or mass extinctions. Background extinctions occur at lower rates during periods other than times of mass extinctions. They occur mostly as a result of natural selection. Competition with other species, for example, may reduce a species population size or the range over which it can roam or grow. Or a species might be too slow to adapt to gradually changing environmental conditions and become extinct as its individuals die off. In mass extinctions, a large number of species on Earth become extinct over a relatively short period of time. There have been at least five mass extinctions on Earth, and during each of these, 50% or more of the animal species living at that time became extinct. Mass extinctions are due to extraordinarily and sudden changes to the environment, such as an asteroid impact. The extinction of species during these events is a consequence of bad luck, fit, and unfit individuals alike perish. So, of the five mass extinctions during the past 500 million years, the most recent is also the best understood. The asteroid crash we described earlier that cleared the way for our mammalian ancestors to diversify. The impact left a crater more than 100 miles wide and probably created an enormous fireball that caused fires worldwide, followed by a cloud of dust and debris that blocked all sunlight from Earth and disturbed the global climate for months. In the aftermath of this catastrophe, an estimated 75% of all species on Earth were wiped out, including almost all dinosaurs, a tremendously successful group that had been thriving for 150 million years. Among the rare surviving dinosaurs were those that would become the birds. As bad as the dinosaur devastating asteroid event was, from a biodiversity perspective, it is not the worst catastrophe in Earth's history. That distinction falls to a mass extinction that took place 250 million years ago called the Great Dying. Although the cause is not clear, hypotheses include an asteroid impact, continental drift, a supernova, or extreme volcanic eruptions. More than 95% of all marine life and almost 75% of all terrestrial vertebrates became extinct. An important question now being debated by scientists is whether we are currently in the midst of a human-caused mass extinction event. This is sometimes referred to as the sixth mass extinction. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 12.11. As new species are being created, others are lost through extinction, which may be a consequence of natural selection or large, sudden changes in the environment. Mass extinctions are periods during which a large number of species on Earth become extinct over a short period of time. Moving on, when Linnaeus first put together his system of classification, he saw a clear and obvious split. 
all living organisms were either plants or animals. Plants could not move and could make their own food. Animals could move, but could not make their own food. So in Linnaeus's original classification, all organisms were put in either the animal kingdom or the plant kingdom. His third mineral kingdom, now abandoned, included only non-living matter. With the refinement of the microscope and subsequent discovery of the rich world of microbes, microscopic organisms, the two-kingdom system was recognized as being inadequate. Where did the microbes belong? Some could move, but many of those could also make their own food, seeming to put them somewhere between plants and animals. Furthermore, mushrooms and molds, among other organisms, originally categorized as plants, didn't move, but they didn't make their own food either. They digested the decaying plant and animal material around them. So, the two-kingdom system gave way in the 1960s to a five-kingdom system. At its core, the new system was a division based on the distinction between prokaryotic cells, those without nuclei, and eukaryotic cells, those with nuclei. The prokaryotes were put in one kingdom in which the only residents were the bacteria, single-celled organisms with no nucleus, no organelles, and genetic material in the form of a circular strand of DNA, the eukaryotes, having a nucleus, compartmentalized organelles, and individual linear pieces of DNA, were divided into four separate kingdoms, plants, animals, fungi, and protists. In the 1970s and the 1980s, the five-kingdom system was discarded. Until that point, Organisms had been classified primarily on their appearance, but because the ultimate goal of classification had changed to restructuring phylogenetic trees that reflected the evolutionary history of Earth's diversity, Carl Woese, an American biologist, and his colleagues began classifying organisms by their nucleotide sequences. So, Woese assumed that the more similar the genetic sequences were between two species, the more closely related they were. And he built phylogenetic trees accordingly. The only way Woese could compare the evolutionary relatedness of all of the organisms present on Earth today was by examining one molecule that was found in all living organisms and looking at the degree to which it differed from species to species. That molecule is ribosomal RNA. Ribosomal RNA helps translate genes into proteins, and it carries out this function in all organisms on Earth, almost certainly because it comes from a common ancestor. Over time, however, its genetic sequence, or the DNA that codes for the RNA, has changed a bit. Tracking these changes makes it possible to reconstruct the process of diversification and change that has taken place. The genetic sequence data gathered by Woese and colleagues generated some surprising evolutionary trees. First and foremost, the biggest division in the diversity of life on Earth was not between plants and animals or between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. The new trees revealed instead that diversity among microbes was much, much greater than ever imagined. In fact, a completely new group of prokaryotes was identified. Called archaea, they thrive in some of the most extreme environments on Earth and differ greatly from bacteria. The tree of life was revised to show three primary branches called domains, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. And it should be pointed out that the domain's names are capitalized. In Woese's new system, which is the most widely accepted classification scheme today, the domains are above the kingdom level in the Linnaean system. The bacteria and archaea domains each have one kingdom, and the eukarya has four kingdoms. Because both bacteria and archaea are microscopic, it can be hard to believe that the two domains are as different from each other as either domain is from eukarya. However, each of the three domains is monophyletic, meaning that each contains species that share a common ancestor and includes all descendants of that ancestor. 
Close inspection reveals that archaea are even more closely related to eukarya than they are to bacteria. So, the three-domain, six-kingdom approach is not perfect and is still subject to revision. For example, within eukarya, the kingdom of single-celled protists has turned out to be much more diverse than initially thought, and protists are not a monophyletic group. Increasingly, scientists recognize that the protists should be split into multiple kingdoms. Another problem is that bacteria sometimes engage in horizontal gene transfer. That is, rather than passing genes simply from parent to offspring, they transfer genetic material directly into another species. This process complicates attempts to determine phylogenies based on sequence data because it creates situations in which two organisms might have a similar genetic sequence, not because they share a common ancestor, but as a result of a direct transfer of the sequence from one species to another. Additionally, a fourth group of incredibly diverse and important biological entities, the viruses, is not even included in the tree of life. Because viruses are not considered to be living organisms, viruses can replicate, but they take over the metabolic processes of another organism rather than demonstrating metabolic activity independently. Their lack of metabolic activity puts viruses just outside the definition of life that we use in this book, but some scientists do view viruses as living. And I would fall into the category of scientists who do view viruses as living. So, the most commonly accepted tree of life suggests that, after the origin of life, the following sequence of events occurred. The bacteria arose from the first self-replicating, metabolizing cells. Second, there was a split between the bacteria and a line that gave rose to the archaea and the eukarya. Third, the fusion of bacterial cells with archaea-like prokaryotes gave rise to eukarya, which then split from the archaea line. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 12.12. All life on Earth can be divided into three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, which reflects species evolutionary relatedness to one another. Moving on. Morning breath is stinky. This is because when you wake up, your mouth contains huge amounts of bacterial waste products. Bad breath can give us a glimpse into just how diverse and resourceful bacteria are. At any given time, there are several hundred species of bacteria in your mouth, mostly on your tongue, all competing for resources. Some of the bacteria are aerobic, requiring oxygen for their metabolism. Others are anaerobic. At night, the flow of saliva slows down and the oxygen content of your mouth decreases so that the anaerobic bacteria rapidly grow and reproduce. These bacteria metabolize food bits in your mouth, plaque on your teeth and gums, and dead cells from the lining of your mouth. Because proteins are made from amino acids, some of which contain smelly chemical sulfur, their breakdown leads to the odor in the accumulating waste products. Once you wake up, you breathe more frequently and produce more saliva, both of which increases the oxygen level in your mouth, making the environment favorable for aerobic bacteria. Because aerobic bacteria prefer carbohydrates as their energy source, and because carbohydrates don't contain sulfur, the sulfur smell goes away as the aerobic bacteria start to outcompete the anaerobic bacteria. So on a small scale, your mouth reveals some of the tremendous biological versatility of bacteria. Hundreds of species can live in a tiny area. A teaspoon of soil, for example, is home to more than a billion bacteria. They can thrive in a variety of unexpected habitats. They can utilize a variety of food sources, and they can survive and thrive with or without oxygen. By any measure, this is their planet. The biomass of bacteria, if they were all collected, dried out, and weighed, exceeds that of all the plants and animals on Earth. While the various species differ in many ways, the bacteria are a monophyletic group sharing a common ancestor. For this reason, they all have a few features in common. 
All bacteria are single-celled organisms with no nucleus or organelles, with one or more circular molecules of DNA as their genetic material, and with several methods of exchanging genetic information. Because they are asexual, they reproduce just by dividing. The biological species concept cannot be applied to bacteria. As a consequence, bacteria are classified on the basis of physical appearance or, preferably, genetic sequences. Although bacteria are responsible for many diseases including strep throat, pneumonia, anthrax, leprosy, and tuberculosis, disease-causing bacteria make up only a small fraction of the domain. Indeed, many bacteria are essential to our lives. Bacteria living in your gut help your body digest the food you eat and, in the process, make certain vitamins your body needs. Other bacteria produce antibiotics such as streptomycin. Still others live symbiotically with plants as small fertilizer factories, converting nitrogen into a form that is suitable for use by the plant. Bacteria also give taste to many foods, from sour cream to cheese to yogurt and sourdough bread. Increasingly, bacteria are used in medical and industrial applications. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 12.13. All bacteria share a common ancestor and are prokaryotic, asexual, single-celled organisms with no nucleus or organelles and one or more circular molecules of DNA as their genetic material. Bacteria have a much broader diversity of metabolic and reproductive abilities than do eukarya. Moving on. In a bubbling hot spring in Yellowstone National Park, the temperature ranges from boiling water, 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius, down to a relatively cool 165 degrees Fahrenheit or 74 degrees Celsius at the surface. It might seem a most inhospitable place for life, yet researchers have found 38 different species of archaea thriving there. Perhaps even more surprising, the genetic differences among these species are more than double the genetic differences between plants and animals. In the freezing waters of Antarctica, too, archaea abound. More than a third of the organisms in the Antarctic surface waters are archaea. In swamps completely devoid of oxygen and in extremely salty water of the Dead Sea, the story is the same. Where once it was assumed that no life could survive, the archaea not only exist, but thrive and diversify. Until relatively recently, our perception of life on Earth was that there were bacteria and there were eukaryotes, such as the plants and animals. But, as researchers have explored some of the most unlikely of habitats, they have found archaea thriving. Analysis of genetic sequences indicate that the archaea and bacteria diverged about 3 billion years ago and that the eukarya split off from the archaea approximately 2.5 billion years ago. The archaea are grouped in one kingdom within the domain archaea, but we have no idea how many species exist. Given that they are the dominant microbes in the deep seas, it may very well be that archaea are the most common organisms on earth. Like bacteria, all archaea are single-celled prokaryotes. For that reason, under a microscope, they look very similar to bacteria. Several physical features distinguish them from bacteria, however. Specifically, the archaeal cell walls contain polysaccharides not found in either bacteria or eukaryotes. The archaea also have cell membranes, ribosomes, and some enzymes similar to those found in eukarya. So the archaea are divided into five groups based on their physiological features. One is the thermophiles, or the heat lovers, which live in very hot places. Second is the holophiles, or the salt lovers, which live in very salty places. Third is high and low pH tolerant archaea. Fourth is high pressure tolerant archaea, found as deep as 4,000 meters, about 2.5 miles below the ocean surface, where the pressure is almost 6,000 pounds per square inch, compared with an air pressure of less than 15 pounds per square inch at sea level. And then fifth and finally, there's the methanogens, which are anaerobic and produce methane. There also seem to be large numbers of archaea living in relatively moderate environments that are also commonly home to bacteria. 
And that brings us to our take-home message for section 12.14. Archaea, many of which are adapted to life in extreme environments, physically resemble bacteria, but are more closely related to eukarya. Because they thrive in many habitats that humans have not yet studied well, including the deepest oceans, they may actually turn out to be more common than is currently believed. Moving on, after exploring the archaea and bacteria domains, turning to the eukarya feels like coming home. We are most familiar with organisms in this domain, plants, mushrooms, insects, fish, birds, and of course mammals, including humans. Three kingdoms of eukarya can be seen with the naked eye, plants, animals, and fungi. Almost all the members of these three kingdoms are multicellular, and all are made up of eukaryotic cells having membrane-enclosed nuclei. As we saw in chapter 4, eukaryotic cells likely originated evolutionarily through the endosymbiosis of prokaryotic cells. The fourth kingdom of eukarya contains the protists, which are often too small to be seen by the naked eye. This group is a sort of grab bag that includes a wide range of mostly single-celled eukaryotic organisms, including amoebas, paramecia, and algae. Discovery of new species of protists, like the identification of other microscopic organisms on Earth, the bacteria and archaea, continues at a very high rate. As we noted earlier, biologists now know that the protists are not a monophyletic group, and they are increasingly splitting them into multiple kingdoms within eukarya. Because they are so much easier to see than bacteria and archaea, a disproportionate number of the named species on Earth are in the domain eukarya. In fact, of the 1.5 million named species, the majority belong to eukarya, with about half being insects. This is more a result of the biases of biologists than a reflection of the relative numbers of actual species within the world. And that brings us to our take-home message for section 12.15. All living organisms that we can see with the naked eye, and many that are too small to be seen, are eukarya, the domain that includes all plants, animals, fungi, and protists. The eukarya are unique among the three domains in having cells with organelles. (music) 